The eastern seaboard of this country is practically paralyzed by heavy snows that struck during the night and are continuing, especially in the New England region. Hello, I'm Frank Coletta. Welcome to a special broadcast about one of the worst natural disasters ever witnessed here in southern New England, the blizzard of 1978. We're going to meet some of the key players, try to sort out fact from fiction, and share exclusive footage from our NBC10 archives. So, put on your flannel shirt, pour yourself a cup of hot chocolate, and join us as we journey back in time to those fateful days in February of 1978. The blizzard began on Monday morning, February 6th. The first flakes of snow did not cause any undue excitement. Local legend insists that no one knew we were in for a big snowfall. Channel 10 meteorologist John Giorsi reminds us, and the facts support him, that a substantial snowstorm was predicted several days before the blizzard. I think the big problem is that no one really forecasts two to four feet of snow. The forecasts are in the range of 12 to 18, you know, 12 to 24. That perhaps uh, lent to the, you know, the image that the, the forecast was wrong. And it was, because we got two to four feet of snow in general, and we were forecasting one to two. By early afternoon, it was snowing at the rate of three inches an hour. An estimated 20,000 people tried to leave work early and outrun the storm with predictable results. I moved about maybe a quarter of a mile. How far you have to go? Greenville, about 11 miles. Governor J. Joseph Garrahy faced his own problems when he tried to make his way to Civil Defense Headquarters at the State House. We got stuck outside Providence College and some great Providence College students uh, from Guzman Hall on the second floor, 26 of them came out, uh, almost lifted the National Guard truck out of a snowplow and got us going again. And uh, then they literally carried me out of the building to the truck. I mean, we knew there was a snowstorm coming uh, th uh, this particular blizzard, but we didn't know it was coming with such intensity, 50 mile an hour winds at midday. Uh, so it uh, kind of crippled the whole state. As temperatures dropped and snow piled up, traffic on streets and highways came to a standstill. We began to start to look out onto Eddy Street and to 95, looking very different than it looks today. And we're wondering why there were no cars moving on that road. Channel 10 parked its live truck at the State House, making it possible to broadcast Governor Garrahy's emergency messages throughout the storm. Thanks to the foresight of a dedicated classic car collector, we were able to pull the old war horse out of mothballs to recreate its moment of glory. Channel 10's Bill Didowitz was the live truck operator throughout the crisis. At what point on that Monday, first day of the storm, did you realize you were gonna be stranded there for a long time? On my way in here, uh, I had to abandon my car down at Mishasic Square and walk up the rest of the way. And as I was walking up, I could see the traffic was totally stopped. And I think from that point on, I knew that this, this was going to be a big event. As night arrived, the situation turned from bad to worse. The giant storm stalled and continued to batter the region with snow, fierce winds, and cold. That means all night long we're going to continue to have this uh, severe drifting and heavy snow problem uh, all the way into tomorrow. Weeks earlier, an ice storm had prompted Governor Garrahy to consider asking for federal assistance. Consequently, his phone call to Washington was greeted with some skepticism. So they asked me, are you sure you're having an emergency this time? I said, I'm absolutely sure this is an emergency. <laughs> Mother Nature had unleashed her full fury on southern New England, and only time would tell how people would react to the growing catastrophe. Our story of the blizzard of 1978 will continue in just a moment. Please join us when we return. Welcome back. We're reliving those difficult days that confronted southern New Englanders when Mother Nature dropped up to four feet of snow on us. Incredible as it may seem in today's world of cell phones, internet information, and 24-hour weather channels, 
It took a long time for storm victims to comprehend the full impact of the blizzard of 1978. We're going to stay here for today. We're just not going to go out. There's no place to go. And in fact, we were up on the ninth floor looking out, and there is no traffic moving on 195, 95. Many drivers had spent the night in their vehicles in the vain hope that the roads would somehow be cleared. We have a genuine snow emergency reaching all the way from Washington, D.C. to north of Boston this morning. The eastern seaboard of this country is practically paralyzed by heavy snows that struck during the night and are continuing, especially in the New England region. Channel 10 continued to broadcast live reports from the State House. Jack, we can barely see you. What's the situation? Tom, here in Rhode Island, this blizzard is a killer. Television engineer Bill Didowitz was responsible for those transmissions, relying on technology that was bulky and primitive by today's standards. Did you realize at the time what a lifeline of information you were providing? I think right from the beginning we realized uh, what the situation was because we were the only station that uh, basically was on the air at that, uh, at that time with the reports. The thing that is uh, unbelievable right now is that we are told by civil defense officials is that there are still probably a thousand people in their cars on the highways and they have been there since uh, by two o'clock yesterday afternoon. The obstacles facing officials who wanted to clear the streets and highways were staggering. Thousands of trapped cars made it impossible for snow plows to do their job. Channel 10 photographer George Clark, a veteran of many local disasters, was stunned by the images he captured from a helicopter. He recalled the experience during an interview conducted not long after the storm. I didn't have any idea as to the extent of this until I got up there. And really, my first impression was that, gee, you know, uh, Governor Gary, he should see this right now as soon as possible. Governor Gary, he did his best to keep people informed and reassured. We're hoping that where people can safely do it, those owners of neighborhood stores and supermarkets, if they would open up so that people could have access to those, to those markets and to the foods that are necessary. Channel 10 weatherman John Giorsi also faced the difficult job of telling the public how bad the situation was without terrifying them. The snowfall depths on the level, that is not drifts, are well over 40 inches in some places. And I want to give people information in a clear way so that they can deal with whatever situation they're in. And, uh, you know, you don't want to come on and say, hey, you know, the sky is falling, you know, we're all going to be buried here by, you, you know, you obviously don't do that. That's not my nature anyway. There's a lot of snow out there. If we get another inch or so or two tonight, it really probably isn't going to matter that much, except psychologically, as I'd say, it would be great to just have that snow in, and it will do so later tonight. Police struggled to maintain order amid scattered reports of looting. The disaster was bringing out both the worst and the best in people. Well, we saw evidence of both. Uh, we saw some uh, uh, ripped up buses that had been broken into and the fare boxes broken open. But that was very little. Beyond that, we saw just a lot of people helping others. People who come in from the, the, uh, uh, the more rural areas of the, of the state with their snowmobiles, uh, delivering medicine for people. Uh, we know the valiant effort that some uh, funeral directors made to try and remove bodies of people who had passed away in their homes. But just uh, people getting together and helping neighbors uh, and people talking to each other. Unfortunately, we, we rush, pa rush past each other uh, most of the time, but uh, it was a time to stop and share stories and, uh, and at least say hello. Private homes, businesses, and public institutions opened their doors to provide shelter, food, and warmth for hundreds of storm refugees. The hospital opened up its doors for anyone in the neighborhood, uh, stranded on the highway, uh, food and resources in the services in the cafeteria were all free of charge. Uh, any clothing we needed, any toiletry items. It was just amazing that, you know, the camaraderie and the uh, community sense that occurred here at the hospital. We didn't put any disaster plan into effect, but everything just went so smoothly, and it still is. And we just hope all those people in shelters are able to get here if they need attention. There were some people who stayed at the cathedral rectory. Uh, there was a Bonanza bus on the way to Fall River that got stuck down at the the intersection of 95 and, and 195 and they made their way up to the rectory and they were put up for the night. I, I remember the first night I slept on the floor 
of the weather center, uh, such as it was at the time. Um, there was they, there was a carpet, and I think I put my coat down and slept there. Yeah. As night descended on Providence, the snow gradually began to taper off. But the city and most of the state was paralyzed. Our story about this incredible storm and the people who survived it will continue in just a moment. Join us when we return for more of the blizzard of 78. Welcome back to our story of the blizzard of 1978. Never underestimate the courage of those who call southern New England their home. After two days of wind, snow, and freezing temperatures, local residents were ready to fight back. Television viewers witnessed a crucial moment in the battle to fight the blizzard, broadcast live into their living rooms. In Washington, Rhode Island Senator John Chafee was trying to secure federal troops and snow removal equipment for the state. But Chafee needed to be assured that military transport planes could land safely at the airport. I get the idea that they're a little reluctant to send the troops up in the air before they're sure that there's going to be an airport open to receive them. Governor Gary he pounced on the offer. If the federal people would call me directly and let me know that they've got people ready to come into Rhode Island, we'll have the airstrip ready. On Wednesday morning, the governor flew to the airport to meet the Army. Over the next two days, desperately needed men and machinery were flown into the state. It was a sight the governor and countless victims of the storm would never forget. It was a delightful sight to see these large, cumbersome kind of aircraft just coming into Green Airport. That was a monumental effort, and the Army, of course, came in. They flew in C-5As, which was the biggest aircraft in the world. As equipment and manpower poured in, the battle against the forces of nature began. The official snowfall was recorded as 28.6 inches at TF Green Airport in Warwick, but Providence was reporting 35 inches, and Woonsocket was said to be buried under 54 inches of snow. Wind gusts of nearly 70 miles per hour had created drifts 27 feet high. Property damage in southern New England ran into the hundreds of millions of dollars. An estimated 3,000 cars had been abandoned in the city of Providence, and thousands more clogged interstate highways. The struggle to remove those vehicles was a monumental job, a job that was not without conflict and confrontation. Despite the chaos and confusion, life went on. Bruce Blaze, a member of the Rhode Island National Guard, found that out the hard way. In the middle of this natural catastrophe, his wife Karen went into labor. I was like, oh, of all times, you had to pick a blizzard, but a snowstorm, but it happens. The guard provided emergency transportation to Rhode Island Hospital. The roads were pretty bad at that time on a Wednesday. People were still trying to dig out, but we managed to get there. And then Channel 10 interviewed us at that, that time. The doctor told me my due date, he said, February 7th, but who figured we'd get a snowstorm like we've gotten. Karen was later transferred to Women and Infants Hospital by helicopter. There, she gave birth to a healthy baby boy, Bruce Blaze Jr. He was a blizzard baby. The Rhode Island National Guard played a vital role in the blizzard of 78. Dedicated guardsmen delivered desperately needed medical supplies, food, and provided emergency transportation. People knew helicopters were around here, but uh, we, we ruled the air for uh, 11 days. The National Guard was working around the clock conditions were harsh and dangerous, but many of the pilots were combat veterans. 80% of the people that we had in the Guard at that time were Vietnam-era veterans. They were used to working in, uh, in very confined areas. 
and uh, under difficult situations. National Guard helicopter pilot Thomas Magnan describes the difficulties of landing in deep snow. If you have a lot of powder snow, it, you can actually develop a, a snow cloud around the aircraft. Normally what you try to do is you shoot an approach where you keep the air behind the aircraft or the rotor wash behind the aircraft, so you shoot the approach right to the ground. If you're not on uh, instruments during the takeoff procedure there, you can become disoriented and then, you know, you, you could have a, uh, an accident. Warrant Officer Magnan recalls landing outside an isolated home in rural Rhode Island and nearly losing his fellow guardsmen in snow drifts. So we got as close to the house as we could and I put the aircraft down into the snow and we just kind of rocked it in until it was sitting on the belly. He steps out onto the skid and when he steps off the skid, he, uh, he just disappeared from my view. He had actually uh, jumped off into about four foot of uh, powder snow. The National Guard has done a wonderful job. 800 soldiers have helped 4,000 people. People were doing their best to help each other out. And if you had a special talent, you might suddenly find yourself in the spotlight. I um, was the chaplain for the deaf in the diocese at the time, and uh, I knew American Sign Language, and I volunteered to do any uh, signing that they needed to have done. By Thursday, the fourth day of the crisis, the situation was improving, but many people's patience began to wear thin. The mood uh, generally was, for the first three days, uh, good. Everybody was high, everybody was doing their thing. By about day three to four, people were then getting tired. We were working long hours. Um, that Those resources that were available on day one and two were beginning to diminish. People were feeling more frustrated and anxious. Even our easygoing governor showed a flash of anger in response to charges that politics was playing a role in the recovery efforts. I think we've done a good job. I think I've been quarterback in this thing since Monday. We got a lot of people who now want to be the quarterback on Thursday. We're going to have people who want to be the quarterback on Friday. And we'll have everybody quarterbacking after this is over. But the public's approval of the way Garrahy managed the crisis was nearly unanimous. And those watching him behind the scenes gave the governor high marks for his sincerity and leadership. I think everybody developed a, uh, a definite respect for, for the governor at that time uh, just because of, of the way that he handled everything. He had things under control. I think the situation would have been a lot worse if, uh, if he hadn't been there in control of things. And of course, that famous plaid shirt that Governor Gary he wore throughout the week of the blizzard has become something of a state icon. When I knew I had to get to the state house in the snow and the blizzard, I put on a white turtleneck shirt and stuck on this plaid shirt. And uh, that's what I wore for the next three, four days at the state house, never thinking that this was going to really become the symbol of the blizzard. But today, every day, someone will mention to me about the blizzard shirt. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, tongue in cheek, I always say, all the things I did as governor, the only thing people remember is my shirt. Some of my friends say, that's okay, governor. That's a good thing for them to remember. <laughs> Our story of the blizzard of 1978 will continue after these messages. Please join us when we return. Welcome back to our special program about the blizzard of 1978. It's been said that those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. So, what, if anything, have we learned from that deadly storm that caught us off guard 30 years ago? The evidence appears convincing. Too many motorists got out of work too late on Monday, some as late as 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and could not beat the blizzard. This is actually a two-way street, but no one can come this way because all the cars have doubled up to go that way. In December of 2007, nearly 30 years after the blizzard, traffic in Providence was brought to a standstill once again by a snowstorm. Fortunately, this storm lasted only a few hours. But the accusations of official indifference and incompetence in response to this minor calamity have gone on for weeks. It's enough to make you nostalgic for the good old days. 
Uh, you know, the kindness of people was terrific during the blizzard, helping each other out. I mean, the, the way that people volunteered their snowmobiles to transport people around the state as best they could, uh, sharing food and uh, those kinds of things. I mean, uh, I think most people came out of the blizzard feeling pretty good about it after it was over. Looking back now, I can't think of another situation that was handled better. Everybody did pull together because it was a mess. Everybody pitched in. Thank you all for your patience and understanding. We should never forget the lessons of the blizzard of 1978. And if we need a reminder that self-sacrifice and a sense of duty are still alive and well, here's a great example. This member of the Rhode Island National Guard has already served a tour of duty in Iraq, and he has volunteered to return and serve again. His father, also a member of the Guard, is on duty there right now. This is Bruce Blaze Jr., our blizzard baby. His mother died tragically in a motorcycle accident 10 years after the storm. But you'll never hear a word of self-pity from this young man, just praise for his father and dedication to his country. Nearly 100 people died in southern New England as a result of the blizzard of 1978. This program is dedicated to their memory. Now, before we go, we'd like to offer a coffee cup salute to the men and women who kept the blizzard of 1978 from becoming a worse disaster than it was. The doctors, nurses, police, firefighters, political leaders, television technicians, and countless unsung heroes who rose to the occasion. I'm Frank Coletta. Thanks for joining us.